Hello, friends. Steve Stockton here with you. Welcome to our latest episode. Now, hunting can be an excellent way to connect with nature and is a valuable resource for wildlife management. Spending hours in a stand while searching for prey can lead to exciting encounters with various animals you may not have expected to see. Hunting provides unique experiences that others may never have the chance to enjoy. However, it is essential to remember that it also comes with risks. In this video, we'll discuss cases of individuals who went missing while hunting. Join me. Let's walk and see. First up, Mitty Rivers. Mitty Rivers, a 74-year-old experienced outdoorsman, went missing on November 12, 1945, while hunting near Long Trail Road and Vermont Route 9. He was on a weekend hunting trip with four other hunters in the mountains and was familiar with the local area. Mitty and his son-in-law, Joe Lazon, walked together before reaching a fork. Mitty planned to separate from Joe, telling him he'd only be gone for a short distance before he would join them at camp for lunch. As 3 p.m. passed and still no sign of Mitty, the rest of the hunting party started searching before contacting the authorities. They conducted an extensive search, but the only evidence they found was a single rifle cartridge in a stream. The speculation was that Mitty might have leaned over and the cartridge had fallen out of his pocket into the water. So what happened to Mitty Rivers? Unfortunately, Mitty's body was never found and the case remains unsolved. With so many years passed, we can only hope that what happened to Mitty will someday be revealed. Next up, Mark A. Strittmater. Mark A. Strittmater, a 44-year-old hunter, went missing on October 19, 2019, while hunting alone in Medicine Bow National Forest, Wyoming. Before entering the forest, he was last seen at a convenience store in Saratoga, Wyoming. His last communication was a text message sent to his girlfriend, Kimberly Mees, at around 11 a.m. on that same day. When he failed to return from the hunt, search teams were deployed and his truck was found on Forest Road 801. Mark's disappearance became one of Wyoming's most prominent missing person cases. An early season snowstorm hindered search efforts, which continued for over a week with no success. Another three-day search in 2020 yielded no results. In November of 2020, the Carbon County Sheriff's Office released a news statement stating that a hunter had discovered Mark's binoculars. This discovery initiated the third round of searching, which involved a canine unit. The report mentioned that the search also yielded other items that could have belonged to Mark, but no remains were found. Then, on October 16, 2022, a group of hunters discovered a firearm concealed beneath some vegetation. The hunters immediately notified a game warden, who then informed the Carbon County Sheriff's Office. This discovery led to a series of searches by Carbon County officials and volunteers from the University of Wyoming's Department of Anthropology and the Wyoming State Archaeologist's Office. This led to finding human remains and personal belongings in the area located south of Rawlins. A member of one of the search parties said that the remains were 325 yards from where his team conducted their initial search efforts. The Sheriff's Office said the remains were confirmed as Mark Strittmaters through an examination that included known dental records. So, what happened to Mark Strittmater? Mark wore light clothing into the woods and was likely unprepared for the early season snowstorm. The most plausible explanation is that he succumbed to the harsh weather conditions. Next, Philip Carnell. Philip Carnell, a 58-year-old resident of Sykeston, Missouri, went missing on November 13, 2022, while hunting in the Ozark National Scenic Riverways near Cave Spring. He was dropped off in the area by a friend, but failed to return from hunting later in the day. Family and friends could not locate him and reported him missing. Emergency responders started searching the area for him that evening. Volunteers and emergency responders combed the area on foot, in vehicles, on horseback, and by boat. Aircraft and drones made multiple passes over the area, while dog teams were deployed to pick up scent trails. Philip's footprints, along with his gun and some of his gear, were found. After two intense days of searching, his body was found by volunteers on horseback. It's suspected that Philip became lost and crossed a slough onto a small island while tracking a deer. The coroner ruled that the condition of his body was consistent with hypothermia and exposure. Next up, Michael Fowler. On October 19, 2020, 
Michael Fowler, a 73-year-old hunter, went missing while hunting in the North Creek Road area of Butte County. He'd been camping with his wife since October 17 and checked in at lunchtime the previous two days. However, on the night of October 19th, he did not return to the campsite, causing his wife to seek help from the local authorities. Fowler was riding a red Honda ATV when he left camp, the Butte County Sheriff's Office wrote in a press release, noting that their officers were joined by Clark County search and rescue personnel and volunteer searchers. They continue, searchers began an extensive search of the area in an attempt to locate the ATV and Fowler. On the second day, searchers located Michael's ATV. Parsons reported that his rifle and hunting jacket were leaning against a nearby tree. His body was discovered 10 days after he went missing by K-9 teams just a half mile from his rifle and jacket. According to his family, Michael Fowler died doing what he loved. In a social media post by Michael's granddaughter, she stated, I am so happy that he has been found, and that's what's most important in the end. The closure for my family and I is what we wanted from the beginning. Now, the disappearance of Corey Kelly. Corey Kelly, a 38-year-old man, disappeared on October 16, 2006, while on a grouse hunting trip in the Beltrami Island State Forest Woods with his friend Jim Naprud. It was Jim's first time hunting in the area, while Corey had spent much time there during his youth as his uncle had a cabin there. The two friends set up camp in the forest, and Jim went to town to get gas, leaving Corey and his dog behind to gather firewood. The two hunters had planned to meet at a designated point. When he returned to the area, Jim flashed his vehicle's lights and honked the horn to help Corey find his way back in the darkness, but Corey never returned. He pursued some game when I was gone, which isn't unusual for him, Jim said. I had no reason to worry. My dog obeys him, and it was beautiful out. When it started to drizzle, I became more concerned, but by that time it was late, so there was nowhere to go. Jim solicited the help of two passers-by the following day, and after a brief search, they alerted authorities. On October 25, Jim's dog, Sammy, who had accompanied Corey, was found. This whole thing has been mentally, physically, and emotionally exhausting. I can't even imagine what Corey's family's going through, Jim said. Everybody's coming up with their own ideas of what went wrong, but it shouldn't have happened. That's it. Jim joined the search later, hopeful they would find Corey alive. Despite dozens of searches conducted by 62 agencies and spanning 6,500 hours during late fall and early winter, Corey could not be located in the heavily wooded area. On October 27, a search discovered some of his clothing and other personal items 15 miles east of where he was last seen. They can't believe he got about 14 miles from where the campsite was. He probably got there by the first night. He must have been flying through the trees, the bushes. I can't believe he could have gotten that far, said Corey's mother, Jan Kelly. They're thinking he might have backtracked a little the next day. Sadly, on April 27, 2007, helicopters spotted a body north of the Rapid River Walking Trail Bridge off Rapid River Road near Moose River Road north of Fortown. The body was later confirmed to be Corey's. Corey's family said they were grateful for the many hours of assistance professional and volunteer personnel provided in this search and recovery effort. We've had a lot of people praying for us and helping us through this, Corey's mother said. Next up, Jeremy Childress. On October 15, 2004, Jeremy Childress, a 31-year-old experienced hunter, went on an annual elk hunting trip in Tillamook Forest, rugged and treacherous terrain with his hunting partner, Shane Louie, and Shane's 12-year-old son. However, they lost track of their campsite soon after. According to Shane, they spent two days looking for their camping spot. Shane and his son eventually returned to their truck around 4.30 p.m. on October 17th, but Jeremy walked alone into the thick brush ahead. It was the last time anyone saw him. An extensive search turned up no clues as to his whereabouts. The location where Jeremy disappeared is characterized by steep and rugged terrain covered with brush with many gullies and fallen trees. Wild animals like bears, cougars, and coyotes also inhabit the area. Authorities do not suspect foul play in Jeremy's disappearance. It's presumed he got lost or injured in the wilderness and passed away. In 2006, based on that theory, Jeremy's wife obtained a death certificate for him. In reports issued just months after Jeremy's disappearance, the undersheriff stated that the area typically sees one or two hunters go missing every season. Still, the majority eventually find their way back to a road. In a 2014 interview with the Statesman Journal, Jeremy's mother, Becky Grimes, said, 
I still have hope that one day he'll be found. I'd much rather have him here with us than up there on that mountain. I still can't go up there. And now, Alan Theus. In November 2003, Alan Theus, a 52-year-old hunter from Eden Valley, Minnesota, went on vacation to Montana. He planned to collect rocks and hunt mule deer in the upper Missouri River Breaks area. Before leaving, he told his mother he would return home by the month's end. Alan was a passionate outdoorsman who used to reside near the area he planned to hunt. However, he hadn't visited the location in quite some time. Alan worked for about 10 years for Geocom, a company specializing in global positioning systems, and was recognized as a responsible employee with a good reputation. On November 22, Alan checked into the Super 8 Motel located in Lewistown. He paid a portion of his bill in advance and his checkout date was November 24. However, he didn't leave on the assigned date and left behind most of his belongings at the motel, except his hunting clothes and rifle, which were not in the room. Allen was reported missing on November 26, two days after failing to check out of his motel as scheduled. A search plane found his truck parked near the Stafford Ferry on the Missouri River with an empty rifle case and his boots on the floor. No other evidence of his whereabouts was ever found. Fergus County Sheriff Tom Killam said, It's extremely rugged, eroded ground. It drops several hundred feet from the top down to the river bottom. It's beautiful country, but it's terribly unforgiving. You need to know what you're doing going into it. These breaks, they are inside-out mountains. So what happened to Alan Theus? Authorities believe Alan became lost in the wilderness and ultimately succumbed to the elements. He was legally declared deceased eight years after his disappearance. Next, Raymond Lee Matlock. 28-year-old Raymond Lee Matlock went missing during a hunting trip in Raymond, Washington on November 7, 1998. Two companions stated he disappeared while hunting elk in the nearby Bone River area. The Pacific County Sheriff's Office, dozens of volunteers, U.S. Coast Guard boats, and helicopters extensively searched a dangerous area of tidal mudflats. The search lasted several days but had to be called off due to heavy rain. But after a month, the search resumed with the help of cadaver dogs, but unfortunately, the only item found was Raymond's hat. In a 2017 article from the Times Colonist, Jack Knox discusses how Raymond's body was unknowingly discovered off Vancouver Island on December 3, 1998, more than 124 miles from where he went missing. Authorities did not realize that a body could travel such a significant distance. The body was spotted by individuals aboard an American vessel near Port Renfrew and was retrieved by the U.S. Coast Guard in Nia Bay, Washington, who brought it to the island. An autopsy on the remains found no evidence of violence, disease, drugs, or alcohol. Full-body x-rays were performed, and no fractures were observed. An investigation was also conducted with B.C. and U.S. police to check for any connection to missing persons, but none was found. As a result of these findings, the remains were buried at the Royal Oak Burial Park in Saanich on May 26, 1999. However, the skull was retained with hopes it might be used later for identification after technological advances. After two post-mortem exams, facial reconstruction, and dental record comparisons, investigators found a key clue, a missing front tooth on the upper left side. No fingerprints were found but they hoped a t-shirt with a truck and surfboard design and a Jimmy Z logo printed on it could help identify the man. In 2013, a crucial development occurred in Raymond's case following the launch of Canada's Missing.ca, the National Center for Missing Persons and Unidentified Remains website. One of the members noticed certain similarities between the Port Renfrew case and the Raymond Matlock case on the U.S. NamUs website. A DNA comparison was necessary to connect the remains to Raymond Matlock. It took the BC Police Missing Persons Center several months to locate Raymond's mother, Carolyn Matlock, who was able to provide a DNA sample in 2015. Due to the limited biological material, it took much longer to construct a helpful profile from the stored skull. And then, on December 21, 2016, 18 years after Raymond went missing, the DNA match confirmed the remains belonged to him. The coroner concluded his death was an accident, like drowning, with hypothermia as a potential factor, after he possibly fell into a body of water 
while fully clothed. After the positive identification was made, Raymond's remains, which were initially buried in Royal Oak Burial Park, were exhumed, cremated, and reburied with his family in Texas at no cost, providing the family with the closure they desperately sought. Now we have Charles Huff. In late November 2004, Charles Huff, a 76-year-old retiree, Navy veteran, and resident of Lakeland, Florida, expressed his desire to go hunting in the Green Swamp Wildlife Management Area, which spans parts of Polk, Lake, and Sumter counties. Charles had a collection of guns and frequently went hunting alone in his younger years. However, his wife Shirley was apprehensive about him going alone and advised him against it. Charles agreed to go hunting with his son-in-law, Todd Therrington, on Thanksgiving morning to please his wife. However, he kept his plan to scout for deer before the trip with his son-in-law a secret. On the morning before Thanksgiving, Shirley left for work and a neighbor saw Charles leaving in his white 1994 Mazda truck shortly after her departure. When Shirley returned home from work, she noticed a package of meat in the sink that had gone bad, and there was no note to explain Charles' absence. Shirley grew anxious and decided to call her daughters, but none of them had any information about Charles' whereabouts. As the night progressed with no sign of him, Terry Griffin, one of Shirley's daughters, became increasingly worried and contacted the authorities. Shirley Huff spoke with a Polk County Sheriff's deputy on Thanksgiving morning. Todd Therrington recalled a place in the Green Swamp Wildlife Management Area where he and his father-in-law used to fish. Later, Therrington and Rob Griffin, another son-in-law, went to the remote location in Sumter County where they discovered Charles' truck parked off a dirt road known as Tannic Grade. Law enforcement officials from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and the Polk and Sumter County Sheriff's Offices searched for Charles daily from dawn to dusk with approximately 40 personnel involved. All three agencies dispatched helicopters and canine teams to assist in the search efforts. However, heavy rainfall impeded the dog's ability to track the scent, and the recent cold snap was a cause for concern for the older man's safety. The search saw participation from officials of almost all local law enforcement agencies, hunters, and volunteers. Additionally, several Lakeland restaurants generously donated food for the searchers. Despite 10 days of extensive searches, Charles' relatives had to reluctantly give authorities permission to stop. A few months later, volunteers with cadaver-sniffing dogs combed the area again, but unfortunately, this effort also failed to yield any results. So, what happened to Charles Huff? Charles was believed to be happy with his life, and there was no sign that he would abandon everything he had. Moreover, his bank accounts and investments were left untouched. Lawyer Rob Griffin stated that it was unlikely that the search party missed Charles in the section of the Green Swamp they covered on foot. He suggested two possibilities. Charles walked a long distance before passing away or was abducted and taken far away from his truck. The family also thinks that robbery could be a possibility. Griffin estimated the worth of Charles' hunting rifle to be $500. Furthermore, Charles wore a Rolex watch and a ring with a large diamond. In my heart, I feel like there was foul play, that someone out there knows what happened to him, Shirley Huff said. But you know, you can't say for sure. Despite an extensive search and years of investigation, Charles Huff was presumed dead in 2010. His disappearance is classified as a cold case, and the Sumter County Sheriff's Office requests anyone with information to contact them at 352-569 one six zero zero. Alternatively, to remain anonymous, you can contact Crime Line at one eight hundred four two three TIPS T I P S. Next, Steve Keel. In August of twenty twenty two, Steve Keel, a sixty one year old former Marine and avid outdoorsman from Dover, Tennessee, went caribou hunting with his friend Brian Collins in the Alaskan wilderness approximately 60 miles south of Dead Horse. On August 27, Steve left to retrieve supplies about six-tenths of a mile from their campsite and told Brian he would be right back, but he failed to return. Brian was not initially worried, but after Steve had been missing for a day, he knew something was wrong. After Steve disappeared, members of the Dover community, including Brian and Steve's two adult sons, also experienced outdoorsmen, gathered to search for him in the remote and treacherous area where he went missing. An extensive ground search was conducted, 
and over $200,000 was spent on helicopter equipment and fuel to aid in the search for Steve. Steve was wearing camouflage, which may have hindered helicopter searches. Despite their best efforts, there was no trace of Steve. A $15,000 reward was also offered for any information. There was thought to be a break in Steve's case in August of 2023 when a family search team reported a possible deceased person in a shallow tundra lake. The troopers sent a specialized dive team to the site. After searching the entire floor of the small lake, the team found no human remains or the item the group believed to be a body from a sonar image. Steve's wife, Liz Keel, shared on the Search for Steve Facebook page that they will be doing everything we can moving forward to bring Steve home. Next up, Raymond Jones. On September 7, 1968, Raymond Jones, who was 39 years old at the time, went bow hunting for mountain goats on the East Fork of Hayden Creek in Lemhi County. Despite being in the company of other hunters at the camp, Raymond went missing alone. When he failed to return to camp, his hunting partners notified the local sheriff's office and a search was conducted by land and air. An Associated Press article dated September 15, 1968, covered Raymond's disappearance. The report described the search that followed, which was halted due to heavy snow a few days later. However, the search resumed when authorities discovered footprints in an unsearched area. Unfortunately, no trace of the missing hunter was found and the search was called off again. Raymond was officially declared deceased in 1970. I believed for a long time that he would be found. I kept hoping, and it was probably 15 years before I finally gave up, said Raymond's son Jeffrey, who was 12 years old when his father went missing. Rumors and stories kept circulating that somebody had seen him or that he took off. I heard all this stuff and just kept expecting or hoping that he would walk through the door one day. 53 years later, on September 17, 2021, a bow hunter looking for a shortcut discovered two weathered black boots sticking out from under a boulder in rocky terrain. He said when he found him, he knew this was historic. Someone who had been missing a long time, the hunter told Jeffrey. He's not a religious person, but he said it felt like he was meant to be there. The remains were identified as Raymond's by the finding of his credit card and other belongings. Jeffrey said after the identification of his father, I feel blessed that I know in my lifetime what happened to him. I'd given up hope of ever finding out. Raymond had a proper burial at Miles City Cemetery, finally providing his family with a closure they had so desperately sought for decades. Next, Pacey Staines. 24-year-old Pacey Staines, a U.S. Army veteran, was hunting around the 5300 block of North Dietrich Road in Junction City, Kansas, around 7.45 a.m. on August 20, 2023, when he went into a wooded area alone. The last contact anyone had with Pacey was around 12.45 p.m. that day. Geary County deputies responded and searched the area to locate Pacey, but were unsuccessful. Geary County deputies remained in the area until members from the Geary County Sheriff's Office, Dickinson County Sheriff's Office, Shawnee Fire Department, Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks, the Kansas Highway Patrol, and the Junction City Fire Department were able to initiate a search for Pacey during the daylight hours. Sadly, news sources reported that on August 22, 2023, at around 6.13 p.m., Pacey's remains were discovered by the Geary County Sheriff's Office and the Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks in a densely forested area near Milford Lake. A graveside service was held for Pacey on August 31, 2023, and he was buried in Kansas Veterans Cemetery in Manhattan, Kansas. His obituary describes him as a dependable family man who lit up every room entered with his smile. At the time of this video, Pacey's cause of death is still under investigation or has not been released to the public. Next up, Jay Schreckengost. 56-year-old Jay Schreckengost, a Seattle, Washington Deputy Fire Chief, was reported missing on November 2, 2021, in mountainous terrain about 24 miles west of Natchez. He was hunting for elk and never checked in with his family that night. After Jay went missing, the search firm involved 60 agencies and thousands of hours of trained searchers. They used ground teams, ATV riders, military helicopters, drones, and search dogs to locate him. Unfortunately, after 12 days of searching, Jay's body was found near Cliffdale, about a half a mile from where his pickup truck was parked on November 2. The sheriff's inspector said that Jay was found in steep, hard country, with tons of ravines and steep inclines, with elevation reaching over 2,500 feet. According to the Kittitas County Sheriff's Office, 
An autopsy revealed Jay Schreckengast died from multiple blunt force injuries after falling from a steep hillside more than once. We're saddened to give news of Chief Schreckengast passing to his family and fellow firefighters, and we ask the public and press to respect their privacy as they grieve his loss, Sheriff Clay Myers said in a press release. In a statement by the Seattle Fire Department, it was said, Deputy Chief Schreckengast was a husband, father, and friend to all, and our hearts are with his family right now, who have been at the site every day searching alongside search and rescue, fire, and law enforcement agencies. And lastly, Sean Higgins. On October 14, 2016, 41-year-old Sean Higgins, his 21-year-old son Trevor, and Trevor's uncle, Will Chandler, were hunting in the Shasta Costa drainage area of the Bear Camp, approximately 45 miles east of Gold Beach, Oregon. It was an area Sean knew well. Trevor and Sean had split up to hunt independently, planning to reunite later that day at their truck. After that, they were supposed to drive and pick up Trevor's uncle, who had been dropped off at another location in the woods earlier that day. Sean's wife, Stephanie Higgins, told Dateline that Trevor was waiting at the truck for his dad after getting a buck the day before. However, his dad never showed up. He grew concerned as it started to get dark and a storm rolled in. Sean was on a footpath that ran alongside a road, Stephanie explained. He's an outdoorsman who knew the area, and he knew Trevor was waiting for him. It doesn't make any sense that he didn't make it out that evening. As time passed, Trevor's uncle arrived at the designated spot, and they separated to search for Sean. However, as the night approached, Trevor lost his way. Instead of risking getting lost in the wilderness, he built a shelter in that location and waited for help. Stephanie received the unsettling news that her husband and son were missing early the following day. According to her, when Trevor's uncle could not locate either of them, he contacted the Curry County Sheriff's Office for assistance. Search and rescue teams from multiple counties across the state arrived at the location and assisted Curry County's search and rescue in scouring the hazardous terrain while the weather remained cold and wet. After four days of searching, Trevor was found with the search teams around two and a half miles away from where he'd entered the woods in search of his father. Following his discovery, he was airlifted by the U.S. Coast Guard to Bay Area Hospital due to severe hypothermia resulting from his prolonged exposure to the cold and wet weather. The search for Sean persisted throughout the night, with multiple crews enduring the cold and damp weather to widen the search area. Canine units were deployed, and drones and helicopters scoured the sky above the trees. The community also came together, with hundreds of members supporting search efforts and providing food, clothing, and supplies. Eleven days after Sean went missing, Curry County Sheriff John Ward sadly had to call off the search. We weren't ready to give up, Sean's sister, Tara Fisher, told Dateline. There have been other searches over the years, but Sean remains missing. Tara mentioned that there have been numerous stories and rumors circulating regarding the disappearance of her brother, Sean, including a possible encounter with Bigfoot. Some believe that Sean might have fallen into a ravine so hazardous that it's inaccessible to search teams, while others speculate he might not even be in the woods. So, what happened to Sean Higgins? Did he fall into a ravine or succumb to the elements? We can only hope he will be found so his family can have some degree of closure. In April 2017, a service was held for Sean in Coos Bay. Anyone with any information regarding Sean's disappearance is asked to please contact the Curry County Sheriff's Office, 541-247-3276. In conclusion, hunting is an activity that people from various backgrounds cherish. According to the Center for Humans and Nature, almost all hunters claim they hunt to experience nature directly. Hunting provides a unique opportunity to connect with nature and enjoy the outdoors. In deer camps and duck blinds throughout the countryside, people from different social and political classes come together to share their passion for hunting and the environment. These places serve as a unifying force for individuals who share a love for nature and the outdoors. However, being mindful and prepared before venturing into the woods is crucial. Even experienced hunters can become vulnerable due to unexpected injuries, weather events, or lack of preparation. Follow local hunting guidelines, bring proper gear, and wear appropriate clothing to reduce the chances of being mistaken for game animals. Inspect your equipment before each use, have a plan, and inform someone of your whereabouts and expected return time. Following essential safety tips, adhering to local guidelines, and being prepared for the unexpected can make for a memorable experience and ensure your safe return. Well, friends, there you have it. What do you think of these cases of hunters who went missing? I look forward to your comments, but please keep it friendly and respectful. 
Until we meet again, be good to yourselves and each other. As for me, I'll see you a little further on down the trail. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'll talk to you next time. And please, tell your animals I said hi. Hi.